At this point, everybody knows that they need to be exercising, but not everybody understands that that exercise needs to be varied and changed all the time in order to reap the benefits of all the time and energy and effort that they're putting into their exercise program. And in today's video, we're gonna talk about how to view exercise through the hormetic lens in order to make sure that you're maximizing all the time and effort you're putting into your exercise program. Now, this video is actually video two in a series of hormesis and how to view all the different strategies, therapies, and modalities that we're using in our health and wellness programs through the hormetic lens. And so if you didn't see video one, please watch video one first. It's gonna give you a great background to be able to apply all the information that we're gonna use going forward. So please watch video one first, and then come on back and watch this video next. Today, we're gonna to be talking about exercise for two reasons. Number one is, most people at least know that exercise is a really important strategy to a long-term health program. And two, it's one of the easiest ways to understand how to apply hormesis to a program. Once we have that, we can then use that same information and understanding and apply it to other therapies that are a little less obvious as far as how to make sense viewing that therapy through the hormetic lens. So here we go, let's talk about exercise. If we had two people, we have a marathon runner, and then we have a, a very sedentary individual, just for comparison's sake. If we took that marathon runner, asked them to stand up out of a couch and walk around their house three times, that wouldn't really be considered exercise to them in their body. And so that type of signal, although they moved their body, that type of signal would be too low to register. It really wouldn't set off any bells and whistles as far as getting that stress line above the midline to really stimulate the hormetic curve. This marathon runner needs to really start moving and running, right? Three miles, five miles, different paces, different speeds, different durations in order to get into that hormetic zone. Let's contrast that to the sedentary person, right? Let's say this person never exercised a day in their life. They're overweight, their glucose levels are very high, their cardiovascular fitness is very low. We ask that person to get up out of a couch and walk around the house three times. That person's body very well may register that walk as exercise. So right out of the gate, we can't create the exact same program for two totally different people because their levels of ability and where that line of hormesis begins is very different in both of those people. That sedentary person already gets in the hormetic zone right from day one, just walking around their house three times. Let's stick with the sedentary person for a little while. That sedentary person has now walked around their house three times every day for the last month. Did they start to see improvements in their health? The answer should be most likely yes. Now, if that person continues to just do three laps around their house for the next five years, will their health continue to improve for the next five years? Almost definitely not. Why? Because our bodies are trained to adapt and use the least amount of effort to do everything that we ever ask it to do. So when we do something new, it's a shock to the system. And the more often we do it, the more efficient we get at doing it, which means literally the lazier our body is getting over time doing the exact same movement. So that person needs to walk around the house three times for a week or two, and then 10 times for a week or two, and then start run, walk, run, walk, right? Interval training around the house a few times. And once their actual heart rate starts to adapt, once their muscles start to get a little bit stronger, they become a little bit more fit, maybe we can leave the backyard and actually start going down the block and really trying to expand their capacity for running and walking. Now, if we do that strategically and we do that slowly, does it make sense to you that over time, the hormetic curve will grow in width and grow in height because they're becoming more and more capable of doing the work that we're asking them to do. Let's suppose that we got that person off the couch, moving their body, they actually started doing 5K runs, but now they're basically a 5K master and they've never exceeded the 5K distance and they do that run at 21 minutes every single time they do it. Could you still imagine that that person's fitness is still gonna now decline over time because the challenge is lost? Let's transition back to the marathon runner for a little while. That marathon runner, we knew we needed to start at a higher level of intensity right out of the gate because their bodies were already more adapted and trained and ready for higher intensities. And now that person's done 
12 marathons over the course of their life. And every time they do a marathon, they want to continually decrease the time that it takes them to run their 26.2 miles. So what do they have to do? They have to train and they have to train strategically. There are going to be some runs that they do at a slower pace for a longer duration because they're trying to get used to just running for hours and hours and hours. They need to teach their body how to adapt just to the repetitive impact of being on their feet and running for two hours, three hours, four hours. There will be other runs where they're much shorter, but much more intense because they need to build their cardiac fitness and their respiratory fitness to handle the intensity of running those distances at really high intensities. And so there'll be short runs at high intensities, there'll be long runs at low intensities, and then there will be these moderate runs at probably race pace or similar to race pace, where they're just building miles and building miles, and they're just building the repetitive fitness of accumulating miles over time, slowly getting that faster and faster. And again, if they do that strategically, by the time they get to race day, is the race going to be a stressor? Yes. But should they be able to tolerate that race? Yes. And if they did it well and they recovered and repaired in between, in other words, they stayed in that sweet spot of the hormetic curve throughout the entire duration of their training, is it very possible that they could do that race faster than they've ever done 26.2 miles? The answer is yes. Sticking with that runner for a while, if any of you are athletes, and I'm just using running because it's easy to understand, we could apply this to literally any exercise that you can think of. But could you imagine that that runner, they're training, they're training hard, they're pushing their body, they're pushing the limits. They're starting to see that they're slowing down over time. Maybe they just had a baby a few months ago and they're still recovering. Maybe their demand at work is higher than it's been in a long time. Maybe they just lost their job. Maybe they're not fueling their body the right way to handle all that training. Maybe they're not sleeping as well as they need to recover from that training. But they have a deadline and a goal, and so they train through that regardless. Their performance starts to decline. What's the first thing that this person is going to do? If you're an athlete, you know the answer. They're going to work harder. Why are they going to work harder? Because performance is going down. And as performance goes down, clearly that must mean I am not working hard enough I need to put in more time and more hours. So on the curve, this person is now on diminishing returns, right? They're still in the hormetic curve, but they're definitely on the, the far end of that hormetic curve. They're on diminishing return. They're putting in more time. They're putting in more effort, but their performance is starting to slip. What do they then do? Typically, push a little harder, and now they're injured. They're starting to get shin splints or plantar fasciitis or compartment syndrome because they're working hard. Their body's telling them you're under recovered, you're training too hard, but in their mind, they need to train harder in order to get to the goal that they're trying to accomplish. That is the typical athlete working their way too far down that hormetic curve. What does that person need to do? They could train a little less hard or a little less intense. They could take a few days off. Most of them won't do that, but what else could they do? They could find other ways in their life to improve recovery. Most overtrained athletes, what we would call overtrained athletes, are sometimes overtraining, but usually they're just under recovering. So we can add other strategies to that person's life to recover faster in that downtime, which would push them back into the sweet spot or the edge of diminishing return, allowing them to train under the hormetic curve and then still improve performance over time. Let's go back to the sedentary person for a little while. They've been doing their 5Ks. They feel pretty good about their 5K. Their distances are consistent. Their times are consistent. And someone gets a bug in their ear. You know, you should try to do a marathon. They get really excited about it. There's a marathon in two weeks. They sign up and they run the marathon. They're thinking, hey, I used to just sit at a computer and a desk all day on a couch all night. I didn't move my body for decades. I've now been doing 5Ks for six months. I'm killing it. I'm going to do a marathon. So you take a 5K runner and you let them do a marathon in two weeks. How is that going to go? Not well, right? Why? Because they were working in their hormetic curve. They started to lose their fitness because they stayed doing the exact same exercise week after week, month after month. They got really good at a very specific goal. They've now exceeded that by over seven times the intensity. And so right away, they went from building the hormetic curve to sort of plateauing at that line. 
And now they're already sinking down the far end of that curve, far exceeding their capacity to perform. They are now doing far more damage than they can recover from. And now they're going to be injured and it's going to take weeks and months to repair just to get back into the groove. Now we can take either one of those athletes or we could take any athlete and we could start to grade their performance, understand where they actually are on this curve. Are they doing the same things over and over again for years on end? Or do they continually change their exercise program regularly? Over time, are they seeing increased capacity for workload? Or over time, are they shrinking, not able to do as much for as long? And once we start to understand where they are in that curve, then we could start to make recommendations. We need to recover better. We need to fuel better. We need to push harder. We could really start to understand how to use this curve and their exercise program to continually broaden the curve, raise the height of the curve, and make them stronger, more resilient, and more adaptable over time with a little bit of guidance. Now, can you do it on your own? Of course you can. Why do I say with guidance? Well, I'll tell you, at least through personal experience, my background before doing any of this was exercise physiology. I went to college to learn how to program sports and exercise. But typically, just being honest, left to my own devices, I will tend to go to the gym and do the things I like to do, right? So there are certain things I love to do when I go to the gym, and there are certain things I really don't like, and there are certain things I actually hate. Now, when I go to the gym with guidance, maybe I'm going to a class where they're doing varied exercises and I just need to participate, or I hire a trainer to program for me. Do I need that programming? No, I'm capable of doing that programming. But if someone's not telling me what to do, I do tend to just stick to the things I like to do. So can I grow my hormetic curve if all I'm ever doing are the things that feel good and the things that I like to do? No. Or if I do, maybe I'll grow that curve in certain areas because I'll push myself there, but then in entire other areas, they're completely neglected. And so if my goal through exercise is improved health, well then on some level, I need to do all of the things at different intensities and in different durations and frequencies in order to expand my physical health in all of those different realms. And so the reason I say guidance is through guidance, somebody else could look at this objectively, not say, here's how you're doing in the areas you're excited about. Here's how you're doing in your health overall. Here are the areas that are really being neglected. And here's how we raise the bar across the board. Your physical strength, upper body, lower body, your cardiovascular endurance in different modalities, on a bike, on an assault bike, running, jump roping, swimming, flexibility, agility, all the different aspects of physical fitness need to be challenged in different ways at different times. Not every day, not every session, not pushing the envelope in every direction you can think of every time you work out, that's going to push you too far through the hormetic edge. But strategically creating a plan that allows you to move the needle on all of those different characteristics of physical fitness over a period of time so that you're never dropping the ball on any of them. You're always pushing the bar on all of them, but in different ways over time that your health and your physical fitness improve for decades to come. So that is viewing the exercise component of health and fitness through the hormetic lens. I hope that makes sense. I hope you really understand hormesis at this point. And we can now take this information and start to apply it to some of the other therapies that you may be either using already or considering using in the future or that you're using with patients and you're trying to understand how do I program these things better for my clients and for my patients and how do I use the hormetic lens in order to drive that type of program and protocol. So we'll see you next video and we'll get into all the details of other therapies in those videos coming up. Thanks for your time and attention. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time.